morning. I'm, uh, I'm Michael Horvitz, uh, and I'm here to welcome all of you to this, to this program. Um, uh, I'm not exactly sure why I'm here, except that uh, that I uh, was involved in, in uh, you know, providing funds for the chair for Richard Boyasis, and that's a great source of pride for me and my family and so forth. But uh, we're going to talk a little bit about family business here. Um, I was playing golf this summer, uh, and I, I hit a, uh, a very mediocre shot, uh, which was not an uncommon experience. <laughs> and uh, it was I mean, just really, you know, it ended up all right, but it was pretty mediocre. But the caddy said to me, well, that's, that's a son-in-law shot. And I said, well, what do you mean it's a son-in-law shot? He said, well, not what you hope for, but you can live with it. <laughs> <laughs> that made me think of a story, and the story uh, is about a man who owns a family business, he owns a business, and um, his daughter is getting married. He would like to entice his son-in-law, his future son-in-law, to come into his business. Now, if Kathy Overbeck were telling the story, he would be enticing his daughter to come into his business. But in, this, in my story, he's trying to entice his future son-in-law to come into the business. And he says to him, you know, I, I have, a, you have a great future, and I would uh, uh, thought maybe you could start in the mailroom. Because the mailroom, you see all the correspondence that comes in, you, you know, get to meet all the people in the business and see how the business is organized. It's a great opportunity. And then the fellow says, well, you know, I have this uh, allergy to dust. And the mailroom is very dusty, and I, I really, I don't think that's going to work out. So the man says, well, that's okay. I can, uh, I can put you on the shop floor. It's a great place to learn the business. You can learn how we make the products and, and uh, uh, you know, just really get into uh, the manufacturing process. And that's a wonderful thing. The fellow says, well, you know, I, I, loud noises bother me. The shop floor, you know, the machines are sort of pounding, and I'm just not sure that that's really going to work. He says, well, you know, uh, I can push you to you know, the accounting department. The accounting department is great. It's a great way to see how the business is organized, how the financial uh, aspects of the business pull together, and, and I think that would be a great thing. And, uh, the fellow says, well, you know, I, I was never that good at numbers. And uh, uh, I'm not sure that's really going to work out. So the man says, well, well, what would you like? And the fellow says, well, actually, I'd like you to buy me out. <laughs> So, so that, that's the story of family business, right? <laughs> uh, so, so I was asked to um, talk a little bit about what our concept was, why it was that we were interested in family business, and why we uh, uh, created a chair of a professorship in family business here at the Literary School. And uh, the, the primary reason for that is, uh, well, first of all, uh, our family, we have family business. Uh, we no longer do. We sold the business now, boy, 25 years ago. And um, um, it was a result of some disagreements in families, which I'm sure none of you here has any knowledge of or experience with. But, uh, uh, you know, we, we found it to be a very difficult experience. Uh, and we know the anecdotal evidence that very few family businesses make it past the first generation, and even fewer make it past the second generation. There's a lot of conversation about that, and, and uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, we we felt that there was a need for some serious academic research in the area of family business. The the, the study of family business, in, in many ways, had been and, and still is. Um, confined to anecdotes, seminars, week-long programs that you go someplace and they talk about family business and people tell stories about their families and so forth. But there hasn't been uh, a lot of serious academic research in the, in the area of family business. And so our vision, which uh, has been partially, but I have to say not fully realized, is, uh, is that that we could get the study of family business into the mainstream, the core curriculum of some significant academic institutions. 
where the research would be not anecdotal, but uh, really based on uh, empirical evidence. And there are a lot of questions about family business that, that where the answers are sort of taken on faith, but we don't really know what the impact uh, of what we see now. For, you know, for example, um, do outside directors really help uh, family businesses survive? You know, that's an interesting question. How do you, how do you compensate non-family members in a business where there's a limit to how far they can go in the, in the business, what family is really in control of? How do you compensate family members of different abilities or different responsibilities in the business? What works and what doesn't work? Empirically, not just anecdotally, but empirically. Um, what, you know, there's some big questions too, like, uh, you know, what impact does family business have on a community? You know, in Cleveland, we have a lot of family businesses. What is, is our family businesses the answer to, uh, to getting, getting kids to come back to Cleveland? You know, is there, you know, how does, how does that whole thing work? There are a lot of very big issues. Uh, how do you deal with uh, family members who are in the business, family members who are out, out of the business? There's always, you know, are, are family businesses the glue that holds families together, or are they the source of friction that, that push families apart? And that, these are big questions. There's very little statistical, empirical evidence on these things. So today we're, we're very lucky to have three people who are going to talk a little bit about the research that they've done in the family business area. And in order to, to kick that off, I want to introduce Richard Boyatzis, who is the, the Orkins Professor of uh, Family Business and, and uh, one, of the, one of the leading lights at the Weatherhead School. We're very proud to have our name associated with his, uh, his activity. Richard, you can uh, take it from here. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> Michael is being uh, uh, very humble. He and you and Jane and other family members have been a key part of um, igniting our work in family business for just about 25 years. Uh, and I remember uh, being involved in some of those uh, flight programs that we had. During the first era of the work in the 90s, we created a lot of development programs. Uh, it was really in the aughts that um, you, you, Michael, and, and Peter, uh, and helping with uh, Run the Families Intent uh, through the foundation, really came to us and said, you know, we, we really need to go beyond the developmental part of it, it's back to the research. So uh, I'm glad that we have moved, and in university scale, we've moved really fast. 25 years is really fast in university <laughs> timeline. Uh, you know, we're used to moving at glacial speeds. But um, anyway, so what is it about family business? A family business is probably the most elemental form of enterprise. And when you stop and think about it, at its best, it has all the great features of private enterprise. You know, you have the passion and the commitment. You've got your name on the products and services. You've got the uh, luxury of taking a long-term perspective. You've got the um, insight to be able to work with your customers and the community. At its worst, it's Hayden Place and Dallas writ large. Because family businesses, although I believe um, are the most natural form of enterprise. And I personally think a lot of the troubles we have today in businesses um, started during the 50s and 60s when we started converting a lot of private ownership to publicly traded firms. So I actually don't think publicly traded is good for the businesses. It's good for those of us investing in them, but it's not good for businesses. But family business has all of the problems of running a business, as you well know and all the problems of a family, with all of the, quite literally, the history of sex and violence at times, uh, the history of prejudice, the history of parent-child uh, intense either uh, liking or loving or hating that goes on 
and then all of the potential rivalries as you get to the second, third, fourth, fifth generation. That means the process of studying this is uh, kind of scholar's nightmare. And in fact, what we have today are three leading lights. Uh, I, I've been involved in family business in the field for about 25 years. Personally, was involved in several family businesses uh, earlier in my life and in my uh, wife's um, father's business. Uh, so I, you know, I remember dealing with all of that. So, but the dilemma is when you try to do research, you run into a wall, and the wall is called privacy. And, and the, I was just in Greece visiting some family, and, and the government of Greece has ensured through their practices and policies that almost no one pays taxes of the people that owe taxes. Because the whole thing about under the table, the second set of books, you know, cash transactions versus other things. I mean, if you ever go and, and study the actual economy of Greece, you'd find out um, that it makes what we do here look like kids play. But what we do here is very significant. So to get research in which you're able to actually study what leads to a successful family business year after year. Well, you know, some of you might be publicly traded. Some of you might have outside investors, so you have to file uh, various forms. But most family businesses don't. You know, the only person who needs to see your books is the IRS in the state. And the question is, which set of books do you show them? Now, I'm not making out like everybody is trying to evade taxes, but there are all sorts of gray areas, you know, as to whose car lease is put on the expenses, uh, who gets paid for doing what extra work, whose pension gets contributed to. So it's in that context that when you say, let's study what leadership effectiveness, leadership transition, family councils, board participation, all these issues are, we're fundamentally stuck. And that was the challenge that John Neff, who was going to be our first presenter, took up with his first round of doctoral studies that he did for his uh, doctor management program. The question was, if getting consistent financial data is so hard, and we're not sure that it's reliable, and we know not only is revenue sometimes adjusted, or profit is a lot through variations of work and process. And even employment numbers vary as to how credible it is, depending on how you classify people. So he took the mantle of trying to say, could we find some other set of measures that we could measure, we could assess, people would be more willing to share the data with us so we can get an accurate measure of whether or not businesses, what family businesses are doing well. And John will share some of those uh, insights in a moment. The second presentation, which um, Michael already alluded to by Kathy Overbeck, addressed a perpetual problem, which um, Kathy is very gracious in the way she handles it. I'm a little less gracious. Uh, Kathy's topic was always, why don't daughters get the succession now that their idiot brothers do? Um, or let's just say, often less competent brothers um, or less eager to run the business. Uh, and Kathy's going to basically explain some of the dynamics of when it works, how it works. And that's the key. Because, again, this is simple demographics. We expand our pool for top leadership by 50% if you open it up to the women in the family. And although everybody in every family likes to say, well, you treat all your children equally, <laughs> excuse me, we're all still pretty sexist. Um, and families very often, in terms of the multi-generational dynamics, uh, as Kathy will talk about, have the, that degree of inherent sexism that they have to deal with. But when it's overcome, it's amazing. Then it leads to the third presentation by Steve Miller, who, um, while John and Kathy have also been leaders in their own family businesses, uh, Steve had the uh, awesome responsibility to be the CEO of um, one of the largest family businesses, actually the largest ongoing estate and foundation of the Vanderbilt estate in Nashville for 30 years, uh, and, and now teaches family business at uh, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. 
And, and Steve took on, as he got into our doctoral program, the mantle of saying, okay, leadership is really key. You know, I, I see it all the time with all the students and all the family business I deal with. I watched it. How do we develop leaders? And what are the dynamics in family businesses that make leadership development different than elsewhere? Because no matter how you cut it, inside a family, there is the benefit of more caring. And then there is the, um, the negative of all the history. You know, remembering what Johnny did when he was seven. You know, all those kinds of things. So those are the three presentations we're going to hear. Um, I would doubt that anything that you're about to hear will be shocking. Research very often is one of those things that we end up saying after we get the results, we say, well, that was common sense. The difference is that it's not common practice. And that's what we're about to explore. So in the midst of many of us worrying, and the things that keep us up at night have to do with financial transactions, stability of the, the, uh, the capital structure, estate issues, what really, as you're about to see, drives a family business is vision. So it's going to be some of these things that we sometimes refer to as softer issues. Personally, I think they're harder to deal with. But you're about to understand how these are the issues that really make or break family businesses. So with that, John. <coughs> Uh, Richard, thanks very much for your comments. And uh, to start us off, <coughs> one of the things I've learned in my few years here at, at the, uh, the Weatherhead School and in the DM program, that usually following uh, Richard Boyatz's, Boyatz's talk uh, only ensures that um, everyone's awake when you start. <laughs> so, uh, let's get right to it, and you guys can do me a big favor to make sure I'm, 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 on, I'm, I'm on time. time. <laughs> Steve, you are the man. Thank you. Okay. Uh, as Richard said, my name is John Neff. I am a DM uh, program graduate, and uh, didn't quite get enough of that, so I'm back in the PhD track, which is kind of a new uh, development here at the Weatherhead School. Um, we go. Just a quick overview of what we're going to talk about today. My research focused in on what I call an effective family business culture. As Richard mentioned, one of my ideas and curiosities about family businesses, what is it about the organization of a family business that makes them successful? And as we'll see, after a lot of um, discussions and number crunching and whatnot, came up with five factors that seem to be very important in the financial success of the family businesses I studied. Um, we'll go into some of the, the meaning of, of the terms, but I also put out here to the right of each of them uh, a more general term. Shared vision being really the direction the organization is headed. Confidence in management really, I think for me, boils down to belief in the organization that you're going to be able to achieve this vision, that you have the capabilities and so on. Uh, learning agenda is really about development, not just personal, but as an organization. Uh, role clarity about your work responsibilities, pretty straightforward, I think. Uh, and because we're talking about family businesses, family cohesion is one aspect that seemed to be also very important, as you might imagine. Again, not necessarily earth shattering, but um, we'll then kind of get into some of the details. Um, just to give you 30 seconds of background, this is my family business about 24 years ago. I love this picture because it has pretty much the whole family at that point in time, all in one place at one time, even though it was a long time ago, on the occasion of our company's 30th anniversary. Um, you gotta love the 80s glasses. <laughs> uh, the other thing I really love about this picture, my great aunt Hazel. 
she was old when I knew her as a young man. Uh, she turned 99 this summer, lives in Sun City. Uh, she's the CEO? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we got past that, but uh, anyway. Uh, but again, as, as Richard mentioned, you know, family businesses are everywhere around the world. They're very important in terms of employment, economic activity, and so on. Uh, and you don't see a lot of them, however, you do see a few now and then. <laughs> and those of you that know about the, the Duck Dynasty uh, reality show, um, it's an example of a family business. Third generation. So anyway, let, let's get into um, my research model. Um, the first piece, um, again, family <laughs> business, financial success. And as Richard mentioned, Success for family businesses a lot is much more broad than just the financial numbers, but in terms of being able to sustain your family business over generations, that certainly is a critical piece. If that's not happening, the rest is much more problematic. And my research focused in on these four organizational traits, activities, that I'm saying, or was hoping, would show some kind of an influence on the family firm's financial success. <clears throat> Share vision, competency management, role clarity, learning and networking. Working together uh, to form this effective culture is what I'm calling it. And of course, because we're, if we have a family business situations, that aspect is gonna enter in at somehow, some, somehow, some way. So let's, let's get into a little bit of what these components mean. Shared vision, uh, in my estimation of, of these pieces that I've studied, is, is really the most important. And again, it's sort of common sense. Where are you headed? And why is that meaningful? But again, it, it's much more than just what you might hear in the business articles and press and so on, that vision is about having a piece of paper, a vision statement. Not yet in the least. What, what I'm referring to when I say shared vision really is that both leaders and followers in the organization are not only aware of what this vision is, but it's personally meaningful to them. That <coughs> is engaging and inspiring a reason why they come to work. And importantly, helps guide action when situations are ambiguous. When you're not quite sure what to do, the shared vision acts as a foundation to guide action and activity and decisions in the family business. Okay, halfway through. I'll hurry up a little. Confidence in management. Again, this really has to do about a belief in the abilities, qualifications, and so on. You gotta be able to essentially trust that where your vision is pointing you, your leadership team can get you there. Third factor, networking and learning, is about development, but not just in the narrow personal sense. It's, it's knowing about what your market and industry are up to, what changes are going on, and giving you a, a wider awareness of the economic environment your family business is located in. And how do you do that? These things down here. Not just networking in a general sense, but belonging to professional groups like YPO or Vistage, professional sales group if you're in the sales uh, profession and so on. Industry associations, in our packaging printing business, we got a lot of value out of the Paperboard Packaging Council. Um, building relationships with competitors and related but not, com not competing companies to share information. <coughs> Personal development, it's kind of a natural thing. Now, and family cohesion certainly is an important aspect, and really I'm talking about sort of the emotional cohesion. <clears throat> Being satisfied with the time you spend together, your ability to discuss and solve problems and common interests, and so on. Uh, role clarity really talks about work role. You might think about it as sort of job description, but I think it's a little bit more than that. 
knowing what you need to do, how much authority you have to get your job done, and so on. Um, an example, and I'm not sure I have the time to do it, but I don't. <laughs> <laughs> we're we're going to cl- quickly go on to this. Um, Richard mentioned the, the dark side of family business and conflict, and I would just throw this out as an idea, differentiating between tax conflict and the emotional or affective conflict. We're trying to debate about what is right for the business and its success is very healthy. Arguing about who is right can be very destructive to relationships. So, my research findings, again, sort of the generic problem. Does anybody have any idea on what they think, what should be happening? Obviously, there's got to be some sort of positive relationship here, hopefully. How about the others? Does anybody have a quick thought? If not, we'll just, we'll just go to the, the numbers as they worked out in my, in my research study. Probably in anticipation, I expected all these to be positive. One of the fun things about research is things always don't work out like you expect. Um, family cohesion has strong positive influence on the vision, confidence, and role clarity. My effective family business culture idea had a very strong and predictive impact on family firm financial performance. Role clarity was kind of a surprise. But in, in thinking about that, in a small business, too much role clarity might not be the best idea. And I have a story behind that from personal experience, but we'll kind of skip to what was kind of interesting ultimately in my findings. In trying to understand that negative effect of role clarity, also looked at the combined influence of family cohesion and role clarity and found that in situations where the role clarity was low, the solid line here, we found that higher family functionality actually led to a better um, relative performance. So the family relationships and cohesion was kind of a substitute in that regard. Uh, However, When you look at high role clarity and uh, high family functionality, ACTAR was was an acronym for the scale I used in my research, performance was actually much reduced, which was still, to some extent, a little bit confusing um, as to why that is. And actually had dinner with Kathy last night talking some more about this, thinking about the idea that when Role clarity is very high and you know exactly what your job is and you're not going to do anything outside that structure. At the same time, your family is very cohesive, uh, can lead to um, a lack of adaptability and flexibility that small businesses often need. That if you're too focused on what you're going to do, what your job is, you don't adapt and, and, and so on. And the same thing with family cohesion, if you're too close, you may be a little reluctant to bring up issues that are facing the business, which combined reduce financial performance. Uh, we'll have some time for questions, I guess, at the end. Um, so I'm going to wrap up so Kathy and Steve have time for their uh, presentation. But again, looking at effective family business culture and these five items that um, seem to have not only um, an influence, but some predictive ability as well. Thank you, John. One of the things I'd like to point out is that very often when we're feeling that somebody isn't performing the way they should, we assume that what we need to do is get more clarity. So we spend time trying to be more explicit. What are your goals? What are your duties? What are your responsibilities? John's data suggests that although that might be useful, it may distract you from helping them to understand the meaning. Why are these duties important? And the real issues that are motivational factors. Excuse me, so that's brilliant. Okay, now we're gonna talk about how do we double the succession pool in 
family businesses. Ms. Kathy? that 
gender norms create a sort of supply and demand effect that diminishes the number of daughter successors. So daughter successors are not in high demand. Therefore, daughters do not really see themselves as future successors. And they do not develop an interest in the company or the skills that are necessary to lead the company. So this becomes a sort of recursive effect. And we know now that more daughters are, or more women are in business classes. There's a high percentage of women in business classes. And many of those women are probably family business daughters. So we may be in the cusp of a shift in this momentum. But we're not there yet. And there are many hurdles that have to be overcome. OK, so I designed the study. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. The second important finding, as Richard mentioned earlier, is that daughters who become successors often have high self-efficacy. Self-efficacy means that they believe that they have the skills and abilities to execute the responsibilities of an effective successor. Oh, five minutes, shoot, okay. <laughs> All right, I'm not gonna be able to get through this. Anyway, so I developed this model that tested the, the effects of gender norms and efficacy on succession outcome. And I suggested that vision is a mediator that helps to explain why these variables produce that outcome. Okay. So I use structural equation modeling, which is a, an amazing um, statistical method that evaluates all the variables at once and shows their relationships. Um, and it produces a lot of information. And obviously, I don't have time to talk about all of it, but there's a couple that I that are really pretty dramatic. First is, I tested to see if vision really made a difference. Now, vision refers to hopes and dreams for the future of the company. But it embedded in that um, are, what Richard had said, beliefs about who are you? Um, what is your purpose? What is your goal? What, are, what is your mission? Um, so I tested to see if that made a difference. And to do that, I first took it out of the model. And I measured everything. And the only significant relationship turned out to be sexism and succession. And that meant that daughters who believed that they lived in a sexist environment tended not to become successors. OK, but that's without vision. <coughs> Putting vision back into the model, everything changes. Now. There is not any longer a direct relationship between sexism and succession, but there is a relationship between sexism and vision. There's also a, a statistically significant relationship between self-efficacy and vision. So what this is saying is that self-efficacy encourages daughters to form <coughs> a vision for the future of the company, and sexism discourages that. All right. So that's the daughter's model. By the way, I, I um, surveyed both fathers and daughters from the same company. It was called a dyadic study or a matched pair study. So this is the results from the daughter's data. Okay, so now here's the father's data. And again, I took vision out, and there's only one significant relationship, and that is between orientation and expressiveness and uh, succession. So what this means, orientation refers to beliefs about the proper roles for men and women at work and in the home. So this is saying that fathers who believe that their daughters have feministic characteristics such as being caring and nurturing and kind, um, they did not believe that they would make uh, a good successor. Okay, that's without vision. We put vision back into the model, and again, it transforms the results. So now, the orientation expression is stay, stay the same. <coughs> Sexism and successive efficacy had positive relationships with vision. So 
The main point is that vision is transformative. Okay, so what does all of this together mean? It means that when daughters believe, they can lead the company, develop a vision for the future of the company, and fathers share their vision. We're now talking about shared vision. Daughter succession is possible. So the takeaway from this is that um, gender is not an effective criteria for choosing a succession, but vision can be a very successful tool in making these decisions because shared vision is transformative. <laughs> Thank you. Dad. The theme that Kathy came up with around the power of personal vision um, several years later after Kathy's uh, transformative uh, research came out uh, was shown by Kathy Buse in her PhD thesis here to predict why certain women stay in technical fields. Uh, many of you know that it's been a major theme in the U.S. for 40 years to try to figure out why so many women who start in science, engineering, and technology leave. Well, Kathy studied the women who stayed, uh, having had a career of 25 years as an engineer in companies in the area uh, herself. And she found that this issue of having a personal vision was the single greatest driver of that kind of career commitment. So we're, we're starting to see a pattern uh, around the importance of one's sense of purpose and meaning. Uh, <clears throat> on top of that, um, one of the things I wanted to say is that John's research and Kathy's, having been completed uh, two years ago, ends up being uh, quite in demand. I mean, they've been asked to present at conferences in the U.S., in Hamburg, and in a wide variety of family business conferences. And in fact, every time they submit a paper, uh, to a journal that gets accepted. So we're starting to see some. I just want to throw in yeah. a pitch. My, my first study, my qualitative study, was just published in the uh, journal for family business strategy. Great. Okay. Good. So what we're seeing is um, a buildup of that. Steve's at a slightly different stage. He, he's still in the uh, in the thick of it, in the middle of the research, but has one set of findings and is now converting it and collecting the data for the empirical set. Um, and this ends up being a kind of key event because one of the things when I visited the Biltmore Estate um, a while after Steve had uh, left and retired from uh, the CEO position, uh, I was struck by what a transformative leader he was because every person we ran into, whether it was a parking lot attendant, a guy, a manager of some part of the, you know, the vast, the seven restaurants, two hotels, the state house, and all the rest of it at Biltmore, uh, went out of their way to come up and shake his hand and ask how he's been doing, and uh, the, the degree of warmth around it said that you not only study this stuff now, but you actually did it. So uh, on that note, let's look at the issue of how do we develop people to be more effective leaders in veterans. Thank you, Richard. Everybody hear me okay? Great. Well, it's wonderful to be with you this morning. Michael, thank you so much for making this possible, and, and I hope you're going to feel good after today about what we're doing. Um, I'm under extreme pressure because I was the timekeeper for John and Kathy, so I know they're going to do the same thing for me. And, you know, we're taking three years worth of work and doing it in minutes. But anyhow, here we go. What, I, what I'm studying is how next-generation leaders and family firms actually develop their leadership talent. Uh, you know, we talk, I talked to some of you before the conference began, before the presentation began, about the low survival rate for family businesses. Here, here, here are the numbers on that. About a third from first to second, about 12% from second to third, about 4% from uh, fourth, third to fourth. But, you know, if you really study it, those numbers are not a whole lot different than they are for publicly held companies that get bought out or merged, those kind of things. So, you know, if you have a family business and your objective is to sell it, that's great. Nothing wrong with that, right? But if your objective is to continue as a multi-generational uh, family business and you're not able to because, of, because you didn't plan things right, then that's a tragedy. So that's one of the things that really motivates our work. Uh, 
The other thing we wanted to do is exactly what Michael talked about. We get a lot of advice from family business consultants about things to do to help our next generation leaders develop their talent. And they're pretty commonsensical, sound pretty good. You know, we'll get some outside experience. You know, have a variety of experiences within the family firm. Get an MBA. All those are probably good, good things to, to um, advise next generation leaders to do. But what my research showed was it's not just doing those things, it was the nature of the experience that made all the difference in the world. In other words, you can move your next generation leader around the firm to get into different departments, but if they don't have the right kind of experience in doing that, it doesn't make any difference. As a matter of fact, it may be detrimental. That's, that's the bottom line. Here are the three circles that you guys have probably seen the model, the three systems that interact in a family business. That's where all the, all the issues come from. And most family businesses spend a lot of time on making sure the ownership's right, and making sure that our state tax planning is well done, but stop on the other two circles. So you, that's what Kathy and John and I are really studying. What happens in the family, what happens in the business. So here's a, here's a quote that came out of qualitative research. I'm going to, John and Kathy showed you a combination of their qualitative and quantitative results. I'm going to show you the results of my qualitative. I'm in the middle of my quantitative, and you all are going to help me with that for the days of it. Uh, but here's an interesting quote I got from a non-family executive for a very financially successful firm in Canada. Huge firm. GM couldn't make a car without them. And the non-family executive who worked with him for about 30 years said this about the owner, who was the dad, and also had two nephews in the, in the firm, who was a brilliant engineer. He had the financial side, he had the business side, he had all that covered, but the family side, he, he came in after 25 years and said, I started this too late. I talked to his sons, I talked to his nephews, and they were underdeveloped people. They were in their late 40s, early 50s, and they told me that. I mean, it was a powerful experience to talk to these people in a very in-depth way. So the question that I'm really, I've already seen the research question is what factors really help next generation leaders develop as effective leaders? So my research sample was 37 privately held family businesses all over the United States and in Canada. I did very in-depth interviews. They were usually an hour and a half, sometimes two hours in length. I had 1,200 pages of transcripts. Read through those five times and coded them. It was really an interesting process. Oh, the important thing about that too, in each family business, I interviewed the family CEO, another family member who was in a leadership position, and a non-family executive. And that was important because those people have different perspectives on what goes on in the family business. So that was a very important part of the design of the study. Another important thing is we only coded for behaviors. You know, it's kind of like Kathy asking me a question about, well, what do you think about the point? We know nobody would admit to that, right? So all we coded for in this research were, were behaviors, things that people told us in the interviews that were descriptions of what they did, not what they said. If somebody got off on a, on a tangent about what their philosophies were, we didn't ignore that. It's what did they really do. That was very important. So here's the model that I came up with that reflects the most important findings. A lot of findings in the study, but this is the bottom line. We found that there are four kind of characteristics on the top half of this model that are the ones that are most closely associated with next generation leaders who are uh, viewed by the pe other people in their firm as highly effective leaders. I was lucky because I've worked with hundreds of family, family businesses through my program at Chapel Hill, and I've got connections to thousands of privately held family businesses through the network I built up for 34 years of Billboard. So I was able to get people in my network to nominate family businesses to participate in the study because they said that family's done a really great job of next generation leadership development. This other family's not done such a good job. So I had a very clearly bifurcated kind of sample for this. The ones that were nominated for having highly effective leaders had these four characteristics. They had leaders up there at the top that were high in emotional and social intelligence companies. That came through in their um, in the stories that they told me. And as you know, Richard's one of the leaders in that movement um, in, in, in our country, which is becoming getting more and more traction, but it showed up very clearly. The other thing that showed up was that in the kinds of experiences that the next generation leaders had who were most effective, they had real responsibility and accountability. They told me a lot about successes, they also told me a lot about failures. But they, they, the buck stopped with them. They had to fix it. I can tell you a million stories about that. But they were not shielded from the risks of failure, or they were not shielded from, from being held accountable. Very important. Uh, they also, on the right side of the top part of the model here, they also tend to engage in personal reflection. For example, if they told me a story about a success or a failure that they had, I probed for that. You know, what you do with it. It's kind of like when you make a failure, 
you make it again? Or do you think, and these people thought about it. They, they isolated themselves in some way uh, to think about what they learned from there. And then on the left side of the top of uh, part of the model, they often told me about early leadership learning experiences. They might have been the editor of the school newspaper or the captain of the track team or something like that. Something early in their career that kind of began to help them view themselves as leaders and to begin to develop leadership skills very early. So those are the things that help them develop what we're calling authentic leadership talent, top half of the model. Bottom half of the model, two most important things. Down here on the bottom, being shielded from most of the consequences of failure, I'll show you a quote in a minute. The more poorly developed leaders were often put into position, there were family members, they were often put in position by the senior generation, they were purposely put in positions where they could not fail. We're going to put them in a position where they could not fail, I'll show you a quote. That's not helpful. Okay. Uh, it's very detrimental. On the bottom here was a family environment characterized by unresolved conflict. Every family business leader that I talked to, every family has conflicts, right? My family, your family, everybody. It was how they dealt with the conflict that makes the difference. Did they allow the conflict to continue? One story a young woman told me was, well, my dad and my uncle used to stand out in the hallway and argue with each other, and everybody in the office could hear it and it was embarrassing. And this went on for 20 years. And it affected her development as a leader. She told me so. She told me lots of evidence of that. Other families talked about serious conflict, but they told me about the process they went through to resolve it. We talked about it, we got somebody to help us, we did whatever we had to do, but they resolved the conflict. So conflict's not the issue, it's what we do with the conflict. And then also down here, the motivations for a next generation leader joining the family firm, very powerful. If they join the family firm because they told me it fit with their values, it fit with their vision for their own life, what they want to do in the career, they're passionate about it, they tended to develop into excellent leaders. If they told me, as some did, well in my family, it's expected that I go into the family business. It was obligatory. They felt an obligation to go into work for the family business. Or sometimes they told me, you know, I make a lot of money. I could never make that much money working for somewhere else. I do it because of my last name. Those were negatively associated with being able to develop leadership talent. And then finally, being promoted to leadership positions for which they're not qualified, nepotism. They told me about it. I had leaders tell me, well, I'm not really qualified for this position, but they gave it to me because of who I am. Uh, and then, oh, I covered them all. Okay, so those are the basic things that I found in this particular model. Here's some things that kind of, how much time have I? Oh, good, okay. So, here's some quotes that I thought represent those a little bit, just a couple of them. Because I think that risk or consequences of failure, that was one of the really big findings. This is a big deal. So, a below average leader um, um, in, a, in a family firm that I've talked to, this was the non-family executive, said one of the criteria that his father and I had defined was that whoever, talked about the next generation, came into the business could not fail. Actually told the non-family executive, I want you to give my son a job where he cannot fail. And I thought, I probably for that, said, well, was that because you know, he didn't want to be a her, he loved him? Oh no, it didn't have anything to do with that. He didn't want his, his reputation solid in the community. And when I talked to the son, he had, he, he was an, un, I'm sorry to say this, but he was an underdeveloped person. And that was the sad thing. He was an underdeveloped person. And that was, to me, more, more important than what happened in the business. The business was successful because they hired lots of good people. An above average leader in my study, this is what a non-family executive said about him. Well, they're innovative, talking about all the family members in the business. They're quick and public about telling you that it's okay to fail. You need to be out there trying because if you didn't fail, you wouldn't be trying anything particularly new. Now those family leaders, there's one guy in this family that people would walk off the edge of a cliff for. He was that good. I had people tell me. Emotional and sexual intelligence, an above average leader. I think through time I understood that each individual has a different way that they need to be managed. They would like to be managed. They have different motivations. Great leader. People would follow him to the end of the earth. A below average leader, this is what somebody said about him, he just chews them up and spits them out and I'm amazed that people continue to work for him. Very dramatic. Very dramatic. Difference. Now, next step. How much time I got? A minute. I'll do it. So here's my appeal to you. Unlike Kathy and John, I'm just now entering the quantitative phase of my study. The qualitative gives us a lot of interesting information. I'm trying to figure out if that's really generalizable to a larger population of family firms. And I need your help. 
So here's what we think happens. You talk, you heard uh, John and Kathy talk a lot about this whole issue of family climate. Uh, I think that has a strong influence on all of these things. How the next generation uh, leader develops or fails to develop emotional and social intelligence skills, the motivation for working in the family business, and how much responsibility and accountability they really are held responsible for as they grow up. Those things all affect what goes on in the family business itself, the climate of the family business itself. And I, my theory is that those two, all those things wrapped up together uh, affect the reputational leadership effectiveness of those leaders and how engaged those leaders are actually with their work and their career. The great leaders I talk to, men and women like work. You know, they love what they're doing. The ones who got, went into the family business because they felt an obligation to it or because they could make more money doing somewhere, they were not happy people. So they weren't very engaged. So you know what? Why not let them be an owner? And let them go do what they want to do. That's what I. That's what we expect to find. But I'll come back next year and tell you that happens. So, so I'm doing a study right now with 250 next generation leaders. Uh, it's a 15 to 20 minute survey. There are three versions of it: next generation leaders, other family leaders in the business, and non-family leaders. So it mimics my qualitative research. Um, each person has five to seven multi raters which are people who give us a reflection on their leadership practices. Um, and I'm looking for a thousand total surveys. I need your help. Lots of you are in family businesses, so everywhere I go now, Richard. <laughs> if any of you would like to participate in this research and get the results, which I think will be valuable to you, please give me your card and your email. I'll send it to you. It doesn't take long. We'd love to have your participation. Thanks. Great. Thank you. is free. Exactly. <laughs> uh, so, uh, what we're going to do now is um, Michael will give some um, comments on the three presentations and some observations. Then we'll have uh, all uh, five of us sit up here and we'll invite your questions. Michael? So I was glad to see uh, Henry VIII up here. <laughs> you know, as he said, Henry VIII said to each of his wives, I won't keep you long. <laughs> uh, it made me, uh, it, it, it impressed me, you know, very much about this, uh, these three presentations, is how much the vision thing uh, uh, dominates the, the, uh, the discussion. And I want to ask Kathy you know, whether, whether, you know, she, she was very you know, eloquent about how the, the dynamic with fathers and daughters changes when they have a shared vision. Uh, and I would be interested to know whether, you know, what happens when fathers and sons don't share a vision? And is that, is that really a gender thing? Or is it, is it just a, the, the nature of the world? You know, a couple of years ago, I went to a charity luncheon uh, in New York. And where they were honoring uh, uh, Pete Peterson. The charity was, was for an organization that, that helps uh, people uh, who are blind. Um, Pete Peterson was one of the founders of the you know, investment bank in New York called the Blackstone. He and Steve Schwartzman founded the Blackstone. You know, Schwartz means black in German, and, and um, um, Petra means stone in Greek. And so uh, Blackstone was you know, Schwartzman and, and the Peterson. And they were honoring Peterson, Ted Sorensen, who was blind, that was making the presentation. And he said, he said, this thing, he said, I don't know why they're honoring Pete Peterson, because as far as I can tell, he doesn't have any problems with eyesight at all. And I think this whole thing was a big mistake, because I think what really happened is that Steve Schwarzman was sitting next to the lady who runs this charity. And he said to her, you know, Louise, uh, that Pete Peterson has no vision. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so the, the, the vision thing is a you know is, is really a, a, a big a big issue, and um, uh, I, I think that's you know the, the, the really the, the theme that I took away from these, from these, these discussions is uh, how do you how do you create a shared vision? How, you know, is it is it a domineering founder of the business who sort of imposes vision? Um, people, or is it, you know, how, how, does, how does vision happen? 
And my guess is that in a family, it happens through the family dynamics, not so much through the business dynamic. I mean, there's a lot of literature and a lot of, of uh, knowledge about how effective executives, you know, create the shared tradition and so forth. But yeah, I think that the family dynamic is the thing that differentiates family businesses from, from ordinary businesses. It makes it more complicated, but also uh, gives the opportunity for the family to have a, a, a central vision as to what the business means for that family. You know, and, and so, so anyway, that, that's just uh, some, some, quick, some quick reactions. And, and I now mean, what we ought to do is, is uh, open it up for questions so that you can ask the, uh, the experts uh, what, your, what your question about your presentation is. Good. Thank you, Michael. So as they're each, uh, as everybody's coming up, and why don't you uh, kind of, if you don't have the microphone on, why don't you wire? Um, I'd just like to point out that um, in contrast to the um, legion of TV shows like Dallas, um, and it's ill that show family business dynamics to be insidious. Uh, there is one show currently on TV that actually does the opposite, and that's Blue Bloods. And, you know, Tom Selleck, uh, one of the New York City Police Commissioner. And if you take their family business as New York City law enforcement, their Sunday dinner conversations are the kind of thing that is how shared vision gets created, shared meaning gets created. Shared vision is not the stuff of posters. It's the stuff of discussion uh, and meaning. Okay, so <clears throat> we hope we've provoked some ideas, thoughts, any questions you have, uh, opinions, stories. You want to volunteer for Steve's data? <laughs> well, I'll say real quick, um, the shared vision in open communication, I'm second generation, uh, my dad's CEO and president, when I joined the company in 2000, uh, the when I got there, it was you know not an obligation. It was purely we talked about it. Said, hey, I'm interested. I came from an investment banking background into a family business. When I got there, I started looking at everything, and the first like kind of vision, I went, uh oh, like how big is this thing? Where's this thing going? And so we talked about it, and then we kind of shifted to a, a second vision. And now we're kind of moving into a third vision, and our business has grown 300% since I've been there. Wow. So in this third vision, I, we, my dad and I were talking about it, and I was, uh, you know, just saying, well, you know, I know that the plan is for me to be CEO, or that's the idea. But I said, I can see we've got like three or four paths. I can see a path here where the business could get so big and expand so quickly that it wouldn't be appropriate for me to be CEO. And in fact, it wouldn't be appropriate for you to be CEO that we'd have to go and get a much higher capable person. I eventually I could probably reach that, but this thing might happen faster than we anticipated. And his comment was more or less through conversation, that was a shared vision, but he had reservations because I'm sure if he's thinking about it, he's thinking that would squelch me. And just, I think one of the takeaways is knowingly or unknowingly, my father and I have a very good uh, relationship. So it was very easy to bring out this issue of, is it a shared vision? And maybe it was, and now the vision, because as you grow your business, your opportunities can shrink or get bigger, that you have to communicate about it. Because I'm sure he was having those thoughts going, how am I gonna have this conversation with my son that, wow, this might not be the way, this might not be the final path. And so it's just, it goes, to, it's a shared vision. And now that, I mean, that fluidity of what we're thinking and how we're designing the organization looking three to five years out right now, we have, you know, open communication about it because we put on the table right away that, hey, yeah. I might not be the guy, which is fine because I own a lot of shares and if this turns into a billion dollars, I'm cool. <laughs> but the idea though is that shared vision is importance, but then it also latches on father, son, daughter, you know, um, cousin, you know, in all the different ways families trade businesses. But ensuring that communication and that has a lot to do with right. relationship. Right. So Fred, that's just anybody want to comment on Stephen's uh, Well, just the, what Steve was just talking about, you sound like a lot of the federal leaders that I've talked to in my research and told stories like that. 
one of the really important elements of the family climate thing in my model, which was a piece of John's where he talked about family cohesion. Open communication is one of the key elements of that cohesion, the extent to which the older generation exerts authority over the younger generation, things like that are very important. I think all three of us feel, and Richard too, that that dynamic is, is what either creates competitive advantage or competitive disadvantage. Well, let's be clear, it's hard. Very Open good. communication is hard because yeah. people, like your father, he was anticipating caring about your feelings in a way which he was not feeling comfortable just blurting out and talking about. So even in a positive environment, things, but often in family businesses, you've got the baggage of negative events that make it really worse. Other questions or comments? Yes. One challenge that I see in, in moving from second to third and third to fourth is the number of families that need to be supported by that family. Oh, right. I've seen that with real Rose exponential. Work, right? and, and, it, and it creates a lot of stress. What, what Steve just mentioned is, give me an idea. Should we be looking at a non-family member CEO in that third, fourth generation? And maybe from experience, Steve, if you could tell us from the built more, you know, it's seven generations deep, you know, when and if uh, did a non-family member come involved in that yeah. process? Well, uh, <laughs> That's an interesting story. In that particular family, there's actually a big split uh, in the late 70s. I started working for them in 1974. And in 78, two brothers who were running the business they actually split because they didn't share a common vision. I didn't realize back then I was learning about family business, but now looking back on it, I just But the, the brother that I ended up working with, uh, I mean, they made it very clear that there would always be a family member at the top. I really wasn't the CEO. I was the, I was the next person. Ah, actually. Okay. So thank you for that question. Um, <laughs> and, you know, it's interesting, though, because that works because we, we talked about it and we're clear about it. But it does require certain, I mean, I went and had some psychological testing done to see could I do that. To see could I, because it showed, well, you could be the CEO or you can be the second person. I mean, your personality is such that you can do either thing. But from a non-family executive perspective, it, it was very important because I had skills that his son didn't have. And his son had skills that I didn't have. But that was probably the key to the successful relationship was because the competencies that we had were complementary. Yeah. So that's when it's that's when it goes smooth. Right. Michael, you had some experience. Well, and, but I, you know, I think you know, I spent 30 years practicing law, and a large part of my law practice was counseling uh, family business, uh, uh, family members of business, families that had businesses where there was tension. And uh, one, of the, one of their few internal themes that run through that, and one of the themes is this issue of family members who are in the business versus family members who aren't in the business, which is, I think, implicit in that question of how many families have to be supported by, by the business. And, and what you find are, uh, um, uh, different perspectives. That the, you know, frequently, the, the fellow who's working in the business or the family members who are working in the business are saying, you know, boy, I've got a, uh, I'm out there fighting the battle every day, and I've got these uh, these parasites who I'm supporting. And, uh, you know, why is it that out of every dollar that I earn for the business, uh, you know, 75 cents has to go to people who aren't working, right? And then you have the people who are outside the business say. My brother inherited this business, you know, and he's a figurehead and he doesn't have to do anything. And, and uh, uh, you know, why why is he getting the, the, the company condo in Florida and the, the, uh, the company airplane and all these benefits and I'm sitting here getting nothing out of the business and he's using my capital and he's not paying me anything. And every time I go talk to him, he says, he says, well, the business can't afford to make any distributions to the family members and, and uh, you've got to keep it all in the business and make it grow. This tension. Is very, it is very, it's very difficult to resolve. And the thing that resolves it is a common vision among the family members about what is the role of the business in the family. And you know, you could, you could ask it in a different way. You could say, does the, does the business exist for the family or does the family exist for the business? You know, I mean, is it, is it, a, is it a value to say we want this business to be big and grow and so forth? Or do we need to view, are you saying, does the business have to provide for the family, whether or not people are working for it. How do you how do you accomplish that? This is a very difficult uh, thing to to resolve. Okay. Okay. Um, I just want to add to that that um, it is 
very important to get all family members involved in creating a vision for the, for the company and to decide what is the purpose of the company and who should benefit from it and how. Um, these are very difficult questions, but that's part of creating a shared vision. And I just want to say that um, in some families, creating a shared vision may come easily and naturally. In many families, this doesn't happen. That's where it helps to have a professional come in and help the family construct a shared vision. Um, and I think that's something that all of us can help you with if you need that help. Okay, yes. I was, I was curious and um, you know, I'm not sure how much this may be for Stephen and his experience or the panel in general. Um, from an anecdotal standpoint, when you look at the family businesses, the family wealth, the family dynasties that have managed to go six, seven, eight, ten generations, a lot of times a, an anecdotal tie into that is philanthropy and how family philanthropy ties in with teaching the vision, teaching the values, teaching that cohesiveness. Um, I'm wondering if that's something that is still being seen in the younger generations of family businesses that are first, second, third generation, or if that's yeah. something that has lost some of its traction. So, so your point is that the family foundation or the family philanthropy ends up being a good vehicle for affirming the shared values and the shared vision, not just of, of the philanthropy, but of the family business. And in some ways can teach that leadership, teach that, all, all of that. What do you think? You know, I have a point of view on that, which may be different from yours. Uh, you know, I think, uh, I don't want to sound too much like uh, uh, Fifty Shades of Grey here, but uh, <laughs> I think in you know, Fifty Shades of Grey, I think <laughs> is, uh, in philanthropy, there is a pleasure pain equation that goes on. See, that, that, that there's the, the pleasure of doing something good for society, or, you know, you know, coupled with the pain of taking your own resources that you could be using on your own comfort and, and parting with them and doing something using. And I think that if that pleasure pain equation breaks down, you, philanthropy is very hard to, to create. And so I am not a fan of uh, these situations where the father creates some foundation, puts a pool of assets there, and says to his children, now we're all going to get together four times a year, we're going to give away this money. That I've, that I've made and that I've created. See, I don't think that that creates family unity. In fact, I think that it can create a lot of um, dissension. Uh, dissension. And, and a lot of kids, especially they live around the country, and say, oh boy, we gotta go into Cleveland this weekend and give away dad's money, and, and we're gonna argue about it because he's got it, he knows already what he wants to do, and he just wants us to rubber stamp what he wants to do. I, I think that that dynamic, uh, in, in theory, it sounds really, really good, but, uh, but it does, it, it, you know, the other thing that happens is these kids become very entitled because you know every charity in the world is telling them that they're the smartest people in the world, they're the great people, why don't you come out and make an you know, and all this stuff, and it makes them feel entitled so they don't deserve it. So, so the, question, the question that we often ask in a situation like this is, under what conditions could it work that way? I mean, that's I, the way. Right. I think. I think what what we're talking about here is a very patriarchal view of philanthropy. I think well, what, what some people are gravitating to <clears throat> more is using it as an interactive right. tool and using it as a way that the younger generation maybe learns those lessons of leadership and development yeah. before they even start getting into the family business. No, I, I think that's by right. Executing on some of those activities that may be more than just yeah. giving the money away. See, the issue is, I am sure, most of the time, it functions the way you're talking about, Michael. But that's the analogy to what Kathy was talking about. Most of the time, people overlook daughters. Mm -hmm. I mean, and just, you know, the, the percentages are um, humbling, to say the least. But the question that you asked in your research, which was important, is, well, when it works, how does it work? So that, and any comments on when this might work? Well, I, my uh, two cents, because I'm, my family is kind of an example of that. My father, you know, he went to all the Leon Danko seminars and all that stuff, studied it greatly, made a transition from his generation second to my brother and I the third, very easy. He set up the foundation and all that stuff. My brother, he wants to just run the business, you know, leave me out of all this stuff, even though my dad tries to bring us in. I mean, there's no real 
vision of why we're doing this philanthropy piece. And then there's the Andrea. Um, <laughs> right, but um, it, it makes me wonder about, you know, maybe there needs to be a little more clarity about a family vision separate from the business vision of why are we here yeah. and are we just doing what dad wants which can feel like an obligation that you're not excited about and you might need non-family leadership yeah. of that effort to make it work right here <laughs> but, but just real quick because i think that's a very good good point i think to michael's very good point i think it's uh my experience has been we haven't done research on this but my experience has been both with my students and with some of the other family firms that i've worked with that it's the same thing as it is for the business does the philanthropy bring the family together or does it divide it depends on how it's done because i see two entities that have helped families stay together and have actually helped to address that issue michael brought up about what do you do with the family members who are not in the business one is a family council where the family develops a vision for the family. Why do we want to be in business together? Why do we want to be in philanthropy together? Do we want to do that or not? It's the same thing. And then I've seen, uh, so that's one thing. And then and often in my research, I did see that a number of the people who became family leaders actually started working on the family council. They had some kind of leadership responsibility there. And the family said, gosh, they can do this. Let's recruit them for the business. The second thing is that I've had a number of students from wealthy families uh, and often it was women, kind of think of it, but that's anecdotal. Uh, <laughs> who, who decided that's how they wanted to contribute, not because somebody made them, but because they decided that's what they wanted to do. They didn't want to run the business, but they did want to stay involved in some way, and philanthropy was their vehicle. Right. So it depends, I guess, is the question. You look like you had a comment. Well, you know, I, I, I would say that in a lot of family foundation situations, uh, what, what ha something happens that can't really happen in the family just so it can be more difficult. And that is that the family agrees, they, you know, instead of having a common vision, a common concept of, of how to go about this, what they do is they take turns. This year, it's your turn to, uh, to give away. We're all going to support that. Next year, it's your turn to give something away. We're all going to support that. That's really not family philanthropy, right? That, that's what it's not. Right. Now, in a business, it's a little harder to do that, although it's, it's, it's possible because if you have a big enough business, everybody can have their own little fiefdom of each one sort of can agree not to, not to interfere in the other one's right. uh, uh, territory, you know. But, but uh, I, I think these, uh, uh, the issue of philanthropy, to me, it goes back to something that I think Steve was talking about, which, which is the empowerment of individuals and having them take responsibility. So the best kind, best way in my experience is that philanthropy can, can help make strong leaders in families and help bring the family together is where the foundation is, exists to support the initiatives of individuals and to partner with those individuals. So those individuals have some skin in the game not just to be the, the bank, you know, the family bank, where, where the family, uh, everybody goes to the bank and makes a withdrawal and pays something. You've got to have, the individual family members have to have some skin in the game. That's great. Paul? Yeah, uh, Kathy, you addressed the uh, son versus daughter succession aspect. Do you have some daughters in your family business? I have two daughters involved in my family. <laughs> so I'm, those, I'm so sensitive, I picked that up. <laughs> 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 so how how is your uh, research you've done? How does that relate to when you get two daughters? Well, usually when daughters become successors, it's because um, there aren't any sons in the family. I mean that's that's one reason. Um, yeah. So so some of the rules, some of the uh, effects that I was talking about don't apply when there aren't any sons in the family. What percent? But I, but I would say that you're raising the question, if you have two daughters, how do you deal with succession? I think the kinds of issues we're talking about here help to sort that out. That you, know, you, you don't want to get down to the point where there's a gunfight or there's an arm wrestling issue. What you want to basically do is have this, and that's part of what um, all three have been talking about, but Steve's picking up right now, is that you want to start the discussions about that early. What is it you really want out of life? And if each person thinks about that, and then they change it over time, 
it may mean that being the CEO is not what one person wants. There's another role in the organization that they'd rather have, but but it really requires that level of conversation. Um, that's you know. So if I can just say one thing. I had a client. I had a, 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 a client who had a very substantial family business, and he had two sons and a daughter. And uh, just going to, to, to Kathy's point about the cultural influences on this, with each of his sons, he was very clear on directing their career through the family business. You know, you should get experience in this part of the business, you should get experience in that part of the business, I want you to work here, I want you to work there. But when it came to his daughter, he would say, well, honey, what would you like to do? I want you to do whatever makes you happy. You know, what would you like to do? And, and he couldn't understand how patronizing that, that approach was and how it differed from, his, from, from the way he treated his sons. You know, so I wouldn't underestimate the cultural influences. Now, if you only have daughters, I don't have daughters, you know, and, uh, and that's a wonderful thing. But if you have sons and daughters, you can see the difference in the treatment. Yeah. Steve? With two daughters, and daughter side, this is a question for any succession. Still, historically, we have children, potentially children that you could have, and you are running business. There is a interruption in the function of business when the CEO has a child. And raising the child, there's still cultural food, raising children. In this room, no one raised their hand about daughters and sons, so there's political correctness going on around here. How do we handle raising children with this situation? And where did your thought okay. show that? Yeah, that, that's a very tricky question. Um, I don't think that our society has yet figured out this work-life balance, and especially for women. And as I said, that the, the, um, the trend is shifting. That's a problem that we're going to encounter down the road. And yeah, I, sustainability. I, I was going to say, I see it, I've experienced it, I've watched it happen in companies I was in charge of, as well as others, in consulting. Mm -hmm. And I, I think in the professions, we do see the fact that if a woman is the CEO and she has a baby, it, my experience has been she takes two weeks off. I got three days. Three days. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, so the reason I would take well, no, but the reason I'm raising that is I don't think there is anything practically that would make it different for a male or a female around that issue. That uh, I've watched females as CEOs and becoming CEOs having babies while they're having babies, and it really is up to the person and their personal system as to how they handle it. But the idea that somehow that takes somebody offline for six months is just not true anymore. So that's that's another part of the answer. Let me just say one other thing. Um, that um, people who are researching gender are calling it the second generation of sexism. And what they mean is that corporations still are not um, adapting to having women who do have these other responsibilities. They are not adapting to allow them to do that. So um, this is, I think, a big debate. If you take the approach that, well, if you're going to be in this position, then you've got to be here, and you can't take the time off. Or do we accommodate um, the women's dual responsibilities? We, we only have time for a couple more questions. So, yes, ma'am. Yeah, this, I was just wondering if a company does want to seek professional outside help in resolving conflicts and discovering what the vision is, what kind of financial investment is a company likely to look at in hiring a professional to do this kind of thing? It ranges. Yeah. It, it really ranges. It's hard to give a figure um, because it depends on how many people there are, it depends on um, how how much dissonance there is in the family. How does one go about looking for that kind of assistance? Just logistical steps? Well, as I mentioned, um, 
I think that's the, the three of us. I think that's why we have, have put our hearts and souls in this research, because we want to be able to help families succeed, to help family businesses succeed. And so that's a skill yeah. that we have learned. I, I would say the cost to put a dollar on it, because I've often uh, had to be in a position where people have asked me for that back when I was running consulting firms for privately held businesses. It could be anywhere from 10000 to half a million dollars. It really depends on how big the effort is and how extensive and complicated it is. So the dollar amount could vary. How do you decide on it? The same way you decide to get your bathrooms redone in your house. I mean, you get a bunch of different bids and you listen to the different approaches people have and then you talk about somebody that you feel some resonance with and you start with some benchmarks, you know, and then if it's not working, you get a divorce. Um, now, in terms of the actual resources, you know, certainly Kathy has a business here. She's available. Steve uh, does some of it. John does some of it. Steve is now handing off a lot of his to another large company that works out in Chicago. Chicago does a lot of family businesses uh, because I try not to um, encourage the folks working on the research to do a lot of consulting while they're doing the research. Because <laughs> <laughs> we have to switch But I also think, excuse me just yeah. Yeah. I also think that the way you find a consultant is you talk to some peers, to some other people in family business. Who are you using? Mm -hmm. A lot of times people ask their lawyers or their accountants um, for referral information. Sometimes people end up calling me uh, because there's family business and a title of my chair and you know they're looking for some help. So I would say you know a lot of it's around that. I know Cozy has been influential in this area in helping people hook up with uh, people. Can I say one thing about that? Yeah. You know, I, I, I used to do a lot of this stuff as a lawyer. And usually by the time people come to the lawyer, it's way too late for a constructive man. But, but uh, I would underestimate the importance of interviewing people, interviewing lots of people, because every time, this is, it's like a marriage, you know, if you're finding a good consultant, it's like, you gotta, you gotta be on the same wavelength. And, and the, every time you talk to somebody, you learn something more about what you like and what you don't like. And I, I think referrals are important and, and all that, but I wouldn't just listen to somebody and then hire somebody. I, I would really interview a bunch of people make a judgment about who you get along with the best and who's on the same wavelength. Right. I think that's the most important question. I mean, that's a great point. Um, real, okay, last question. I, I'm sorry, uh, sir. Okay. Stephen, I, I saw your numbers and your study was family businesses with revenue of 100 million to, to whatever. To, okay. you know, how does that transcend down to companies that, you know, have family businesses that are 10 million and less? Yeah, I don't, you know, I can't answer that for sure. I'll be, I'll have a better feel for that after I finish my, finish my quantitative study because it's a much broader sample and I'll, you know, I'll be able to slice and dice the numbers a lot of different ways. The reason I picked that particular revenue level is that's kind of the sweet spot of a lot of family firms for these kinds of succession issues. They're big enough to be very complex, but they're not so big that they become, begin to act more like a public firm. So, but hopefully a year from now I'll be able to answer that question with but, what I can tell you out of the family leadership development literature is my prediction is it's identical. That, that's what it's, yeah. That Steve is only looking at that thing because for a research perspective, he has to control some of the variables. So he's limiting the, uh, the size. But um, research by a bunch of colleagues called Lessons from Experience, McCall, uh, Lombardo Morrison, back in 88, showed that regardless of the size of the organization, Many of the things that Steve has been discovering and is now testing in the quantitative part happen in businesses that have five people in them. So I actually think the issues are the same, but we don't know that until we actually confirm it. I really appreciate uh, your comments. I'm sorry, how many of you have some comments that we can't address? I'd like to uh, invite our dean, uh, Rob Whiting, for some uh, closing comments. I want to uh, find some thanks to you. And the first thanks is to Michael for making today possible through his vision and philanthropic efforts. I'd also like to hope, Michael, that today enhanced the pleasure aspect of the pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Uh, Richard Lantz is, is uh, has been uh, talk about vision and leadership. He has done it in so many ways for the school, our community, his field. Uh, I, I can't say I'm humbled every time I get a chance to work with Richard. I, by the way, for those of you who are looking for leadership and emotional intelligence and vision, the things that were touched on today, uh, two days ago he started his second MOOC. That's the massive online course through Coursera. All of you are welcome to join me. His first round had 95,000 people. As of a few days ago, and I'm probably needing some updating, it was about 50,000 people. Uh, he has 150,000 alums. The university has 105. So uh, the <laughs> Richard's making an impact. Uh, I strongly recommend you consider taking this program. Indeed, I'm going to try to do what I can myself to learn more about these issues. I'd like to especially thank our panelists and our audience. The panelists, thank you for bringing rigor and thinking, representing the school so very well. And most importantly, your impact on family business, understanding the issues, and helping to shine a light on the way forward. Thank you greatly for the work that you're doing. <laughs> Richard put up the, uh, the, some of the details on Coursera there, if you would like to note those. The last thing I'd like to highlight is the teaching and learning mission of the Weatherhead School. And that is we strive to develop leaders who innovate to create sustainable value and are good global citizens. I look at this audience today, what you're doing daily in terms of the impact you're making on our family businesses, our community, and indeed the nation at large. And I can always say thank you very much for helping us fulfill our mission today. Thank you.